Today we are going to start with an angle that you guys will very rarely see. This is the above my loom looking up toward the ceiling. I installed a piano light. I will put the description below so you know where uh, where I got it from. I got it from Amazon. It was roughly $63 at the time of this filming. It's, I wanna say 31 and a half inches across. I have a 32 inch loom. So that's very good as far as size wise goes. It um, illuminates across the entire uh, fabric that I'm weaving and it um, is flexible. From here up, it's flexible. So you do have a little bit of, of play in it. And I'm gonna show you how I mounted it. But before I do that, I'm gonna show you this clip. A lot of times we get into really complicated patterns and I'm not buying a, whatever it is, $500 tempo machine to sit there and tell me what to, to what lever to move next because it just doesn't seem like a good idea for me. But you can print out your draft and clip it right there. And it's with the knife. I, you can bring it down if you want. This is just, it's just a clip. So I actually had that upside down. If you wanted to know, this is a two and a half or 2.4 inch clip, but I think you can use a normal size clip. I don't think it has to be this big. The idea is it's right there where you can see it at all times. It won't move, it's stable. So I wanna show you that. Then I wanna show you how it's mounted. Now, the problem with the mounting was it comes with an incredibly heavy duty clamp, which I'm looking for, here it is. It's an incredibly heavy duty clamp. Let me lower the camera, watch out for movement. Okay, it's an incredibly heavy duty clamp. And there is a spot on the back of the loom where you could, in theory, clamp this on because it's adjustable. This will just keep moving up the more you screw it and that's what tightens it on. The problem is all of this gets in the way of your frames moving up and down. So you can't really practically use it. I don't like um, claw clamps for things like this because they're not terribly reliable. Um, some are, some aren't, but they do tend to break down a little bit faster than I'm comfortable with. So I was looking at it, trying to figure out how do I mount it? I could have mounted it to the shelves behind me or, or behind my loom. The problem with that is, is that it doesn't have enough reach forward. Um, it's really designed to um, clamp onto the back of a desk so that it's um, over, you know, so the light is over the work area. And that's all fine. I'm going to turn this on and see how we do. You see how much brighter it got all of a sudden. Uh, the lamp is on right now. So I could have done that. I have, I believe this loom is 29 inches deep. I have a desk that's 30 inches deep that I'm using it on. And I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll just clamp it to the back of my desk and it'll be perfect. Kind of, <laughs> it kind of is because on the back side of the loom, you also have a bar like this and it butts right up against that bar. And the problem with that is, is it'll impede your, your fabric moving forward. It'll impede your warp uh, smoothly coming off of the back beam. And can't have that either. So clamping it to the back of the desk really didn't work. And so then we went into problem solving mode. And what we came up with is this is originally screwed to the base of this piano lamp. And if, it, if it's attached, it has to be able to unattach. So there was a sticker here, a white sticker, and I removed it, which exposed four screws. Now I know that I can take this clamp off and what I ended up with is the base of this piano lamp without a clamp. 
Now I have to figure out how to mount it. And uh, I know it's a little sacrilegious, but we decided that if we could replace those screws with something longer that we could drill into the castle on the loom. That is a very personal decision and I know a lot of people just shuddered, but it's okay. <laughs> We, um, uh, my husband went to the hardware store and he found the right, um, uh, uh, screws, uh, in the right length. They needed an Allen wrench. He had to find the right drill bit. He found all of that. And what we did is we actually drilled four holes into the castle, right square in the middle, a little bit. Uh, toward the center and uh, once the drill the the screws or the holes were drilled we went up through the bottom and we screwed the um, lamp directly to the castle ledge um, so I'm going to move the camera if it shakes I'll apologize but I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like back there We have now got this screwed directly to it. It doesn't move. It is happy it's not going anywhere and it didn't even impede any of the holes. If you're going to use a four shaft um, treadle kit, it doesn't even impede the holes. Um, I'm not using that, but if you do, it's good to know that that's true. And I come up as much as I can without blinding you. I'm sorry. This. Okay, that's what it looks like from up above. You've got the light right there. Where is adjustable coming back down? Okay, so that's lighting number one. Um, it also, there's no wires coming back up. Oh, sorry, there's a light. I'm going to push this down so we can actually see. Uh, it plugs in right at the bar, so you don't have loose wires there. And the adapter is right at the base. So the most I'm going to have to do is just tack this down so it's not obnoxious. My desk has an outlet, right? Try this again. Right there. So I can easily plug it in. Um, and it's just a simple touch button. There's different adjustments, different kind of lighting that you can use. It's great. So that's lighting adjustment number one that I made. Lighting adjustment number two was here. It's kind of dark. You don't get good light here. For the average user, that's okay. It doesn't make that much difference. But if you're doing videos and you really want people to see what's going on back there, it does make a difference. So to that end, I bought under cabinet mounting um, uh, uh, lights. They are rechargeable. The uh, US, what do they call it? USB-C to USB port. It comes with it. Um, I just set up a, a station next to my um, loom that I can charge them at night. This is what they look like. This is the back side and this is the front side. I'll do it like this so you can actually see them turn on. Um, when they are charging, this little uh, nub will show orange. When they're done charging, they will show green, so you know when to unplug them. And they are mounted underneath just by double sticky, double stick sticky tape and metal, a metal bar that comes with it. The metal bar just looks like this. It's nothing fancy. So what I do is at the end of uh, uh, weaving, I will take them off and I will put them on the charger that's right next to my loom. But um, they're really quick and easy to pop in and out. It's just a metal bar and it's just using a magnet. I originally mounted it 
further back on the castle, but I wasn't getting the lighting up front. So I've now, even though you can see it a little bit here, I had to be okay with that. I mounted them so that they are flush with the leading edge of this castle right here. And this is how much brighter it makes things. It's a substantial difference. So I'm gonna turn on this one. You have two settings, one is full on and one is um, like motion detector. I don't want it to be flashing on and off, so I'm just putting it full on. But you can see you get a lot more light concentrated there. Um, that's really good, very useful when you're um, threading through your heddles. I have an eight shaft Ashford 32 inch. One of the things that is very, very typical is um, grabbing, when you're threading through the heddles, grabbing a heddle from the wrong shaft. It gets kind of frustrating. So there's a technique I came up with that that may be useful to you. And that is to color code the heddles. Now as they sit here, they look pretty normal. When you pull them up, I've color coded them underneath. And that is, I'm gonna pull it in just a little bit more because I want, we wanna be able to see it as best as we can. I don't know that we're gonna get much closer, but yeah, the back heddle is orange. I also took a gold paint pen and you really won't be able to see this and that's okay. But I took a gold paint pen and I marked the center point because when I'm, um, when I am uh, slaying on, uh, slaying the heddles, I'm gonna work from the middle out so that I have less of a chance of excess heddles bunching up the fabric in the corners here and here. The other thing you can do is as you're moving it through, calculate how many extra heddles you're going to have per shaft and then just evenly distribute them throughout the fabric, or, or excuse me, throughout the shaft, um, because they're not going to impede your um, work if it's a random one here or there. So I have a pattern that is 15, um, 15 heddles across, 15 warp threads across in a V shape. So if I get to the end of that V and on every single shaft I just have one extra unused heddle, I will have spaced it out across the entire project. Um, and if you have a couple of heddles here on the side, that's fine. It's not going to impede the fabric, but having a random four or five as opposed to 30 does make a difference. So that was a another little trick. Now on these, I, if you notice, um, these, this is just permanent marker. This is just a Sharpie permanent marker, nothing fancy. When you have the heddles uh, and the frame off of the machine, just put some cardboard or paper underneath and just start coloring it in. I have a picture that I'll also um, insert into this if I can make that work. Um, so the back one is orange. The second one is black. So when I go to grab the eighth shaft, I'm gonna very quickly know that I'm grabbing an orange heddle. And some people, you know, when you would use permanent marker, it's like, ooh, that's not good <laughs> because your fabric could get, um, your fabric could get uh, discolored, it could get, um, you know, the permanent marker on it, but it's not going to because your threads are going through way up here. The color's way down there. And it's not transferring anywhere. I'm going to sit here and rub it, and I don't have any orange on my fingers. So um, just pick a different color for each shaft. Um, I did it where it's a stark contrast between the different layers. The different shafts. So I have orange on the eighth and black on the seventh. I have hot pink for the sixth. I have royal blue for the fifth. You can see it there. I have a sunshine yellow 
for the fourth. A Christmassy red for the third. A Christmassy green for the second. And a lavender for the first. So each one of these heddles, um, um, each one of the shafts is going to be a distinctly different color. And one of the techniques for how do you grab the correct heddle, if you grab it from here, from the middle, you may actually end up grabbing, you know, one behind and you kind of get them in the wrong order. But if you grab your heddles from the base, they're always going to come off in the right order. They just are. Okay. And because that's where the color is, you know you're getting the right shaft. It's, it's your insurance policy. Let's say you mess it up. <laughs> you, you, you messed up your threading and you've got an inversion error. Um, remember those extra heddles that we dispersed throughout the entire warp? Um, the likelihood is higher that there will be an empty heddle somewhere very close. So instead of having to re-thread 150 <laughs> of your warp threads, you may have to redo five to, to fix that error because there was a spare heddle very close to where you needed it. And that's true on all five shafts, or all eight shafts, pardon me. If that's not true, and I'll do this in a different video, there is a way to cut an empty heddle from somewhere else, and you can, my fingers won't work, there you go. You can cut your heddle, an, uh, an unused heddle, from way back here and splice it into where you need it. Um, it's a little fiddly, but it's so much better than having to rethread half of your warp. Um, I, I would use that as a last resort, but I absolutely did use it when I made errors on the last warp. And that's where you see these little uh, cute blue tags. I don't know if you can see that well. Hopefully you can. Okay. okay. This right here is a heddle that I moved into uh, a position where I needed it and then I just, I had literally cut it and then this uh, blue is just um, splicing it back together. So you can do that, it's actually not too difficult. And I'm gonna move these back up again just so that you can see a little bit closer to what we're looking at. See if you can see, there we go, there's the black. Hot pink, royal blue, bright yellow, Christmas red, Christmas green, and move back a little bit, and there's the lavender. So that does make um, warping on in pattern a little bit easier, a little bit easier to see where you're going and why. The One of the next videos is going to be an explanation of exactly why I have, pull this back up, Why do I have my warp set up this way? Um, I'm actually going to, I have not warped on. Um, I haven't uh, wound it on the back beam. I'm actually sitting obviously at the front of the machine or the front of the loom. And I'm going to, uh, I've slayed it through the reed. The reed is being held up. I'll move this very carefully. The reed is being held up by uh, my helping hands um, cord that is attached to the back beam and to the front beam. And with this, I'm literally going to start, I've got a uh, yarn that marks my center point. I'm going to start warping on in pattern and just knot it behind the heddles in small groups. When I'm done, I will then go around to the back beam and physically tie it on to the leaf stick on the back beam. Um, and then this is already slayed. This reed is already slayed. And once that's done, 
I can take out one of these Lee sticks, which is holding my crossovers. Ignore the couple that are in error. Uh, it's holding my crossovers. And then uh, I can wind it onto my back beam. If I need to um, mock up a tensioning device, which I tend to like to use, it gives me better tension across the warp because everything is, all the warps are through this, um, through the heddles. I can insert the tensioning device, which is dowels. It's a series of dowels that I do in a plain weave distribution. One up, one down, one up, one down. This particular warp happens to have that built in. So um, I can do one up, one down, one up, one down, insert the first, um, the first dowel, and then flip it all the way across and insert the next dowel and just keep doing that until I have the tension that I want. And when you do one up, one down over tensioning rods, you end up with these little crosses, just like you do on the leaf stick. You end up with little crosses in your yarn, which means they can't jump into the neighboring lane. They're gonna stay in their lane because of those crosses holding them in place. Um, so that's part of the warping that I'll do um, next. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else with the, the piano lamp, uh, the underlighting, and uh, the color coding. I think that's it for this video. And I will come back later and I will show you more of what I'm doing with this warp. I'm learning along the way and you're going to learn with me. Um, you kind of can't mess up weaving. <laughs> you can't mess it up. Uh, be fearless. Just try things. Be okay making mistakes and, um, and, and be okay learning the process as you go. It's actually mistakes are one of the best ways that you can learn. And if I make mistakes, you get to learn from my mistakes. So that's even better. We're not perfect. I'm not going to be pretend to be perfect. Um, I think it's a horrible thing. <laughs> Nobody's perfect and that's okay. We should embrace that a bit more. So I wanted to show you where I got so far and I will come back and talk more about the warping next time.